welcome to a Bass Automatic. To an episode of the Bass Automatic. And I'm your host, Captain Gorgeous. And I'm your host, Captain Know-It-All. So, you might remember our previous episode. Obviously, we talked a lot about, you know, our other previous episode about Huawei back in the early days because somebody complained about but the good old days about us using toys back in the days. Well, obviously, we are a bit of the low budget corporal, dumb, aren't we? Yeah. So we had to use, uh, well, miniatures and small vehicles, didn't we? Well, yes. Because obviously, we all know now that in the humble years later on, because everyone always thinks that we will sort of some horrible, evil competition against Top Gear, won't we? Well, no, they didn't. Nobody didn't know we existed. Well, yeah, but thing is, though, we've been doing it for quite a while, won't we? Well, yes, but we had many adventures, like we mentioned about our comp event uh, adventures, didn't we? You know, going in them camper vans and we, we, we had to deal with dangerous wildlife, didn't we? Yes, we did. Yeah, the humble, dangerous killer squirrel. Now, if you actually don't believe that squirrels are actually dangerous, well, you try sleeping out in the night in 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 in, 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 in conditions like we had to. Yeah, let's milk it really hard and really quick. Yeah, it was really dangerous stopping in our vehicles, even kicking out vans and stuff and um, vabs, weren't we? And all sorts of vehicles we we used to sleep in it because we found out later on all them years we took gear was making out them old men were sleeping in cars. They weren't who stopping at bloody old towns. Well, we did the same, because ours weren't even real cars, were they? Well, yeah, or what, but, yeah, they're coming clean, because they obviously they've done the last, you know, um, let's do them grand tour, aren't they? Well, yes, they have. Well, we all know that, you know, Richard Hammond is in his Capri, and, um, yeah, James May drives a stag, like... George, yeah. You mean boy George? No, the one and only George. You no, know, from my child dad. Oh, you mean like George from that popular children's program, aren't we? And you know what will give us inspiration about Top Gear and that, aren't you? No, are you on about Zippy and George and Bango and all that? Look, from Rainbow. Oh, I can't watch that. My mum said that was blasphemous to um, you know, to the religion of God. Right. Well, there was, you know, they did teach us about the Bible, didn't they, at Rainbow? But, hey, uh, we're going off the beaten track. No, 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 what about the stag? Right. There's only one famous judge what drives the stag, because, um, uh, she gave the inspiration of uh, running local people over with. Oh, what? Eh? Yeah, I'm confused now. Well, I'm talking about the one and the only Sam Peckinpah's um, Straw Dog. So, it's a movie about straw dogs, but somehow it's got a car in it then. Well, no, not as such. No, the, the movie's about, you know, uh, people fixing your bomb roof or whatever, you know, what building it is. What? It's, it's like cowboys. Cowboys? So it's a western? Well, it could be classed as a western, but it's about, you know, uh, cowboy builders. Right, so, and, um, I don't get it. Well, obviously, um, well, the movie's about American going to live in Cornwall, right, because he's got, um, you know, Susan George is, you know, his wife, and obviously, you know, she wants to live in a local um, village, 
and uh, yeah, um, they're getting some DIY done, and obviously they need a professional rat catcher as well. What? This is sounding very confusing. What? And you've seen the movie? Well, yes, I have seen the movie. It, it got actually banned. I'm not surprised it got banned. How complicated it sounds. No, it's not that complicated. I think the complications was that it, it had bad driving in it, right? And um, uh, there was other films like that had bad driving as well in 1971. Like what? Well, there was a movie called Clockwork Orange. And is that about cars? Well, yeah, it was some bunch of teenagers what like what well, to do look like they're in the bloody 50s but um yeah they, they, they steal a car and they, and um they sort of don't know the rules of how to drive in britain what you mean by that well they're driving on the wrong side of the road right oh right so they're not driving on the right hand side yeah, they're driving on the left-hand side. No, they're driving on the right-hand side, right? Incoming traffic in the UK. All right, so the movie is a British movie, then? No, it was filmed by... Well, um, well, yeah, you could say, maybe. You don't actually know, do you? Well, no, I don't, actually. So why would you mention it, then, if you don't know nothing about it, then? Well, the point is that the movie was banned. Like, uh, that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, but why? Well, the, the movie was very popular to um, have an inspiration for very famous young um, directors. They got inspired by this movie, well, specifically this movie. But why is that irrelevant, then? Yeah, I'm quite curious what director you're on about. Well, I could play a clip and you'll know who it is, won't you? Clockwork Orange uh, was, I think, the first punk rock movie ever made. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it, was, it was a very bleak vision of a dangerous future where young people, teenagers, are free to roam the streets without any kind of parental, you know, exception. And, and they break into homes and they assault and rape people and it was that the subject matter was dangerous um, but Kubrick had a kind of twinkle in his eye especially the scene where you hear Gene Kelly singing singing in the rain uh, when he's basically kicking a man practically to death and that was one of the most horrifying things I think I've ever witnessed just a counterpoint of the music and the song and and kicking him every time the music commanded it and and that was audacious and, and i think very dangerous in its time and and when you put on singing in the rain during that sequence where he's kicking that person to death it is utterly contemptuous and it is almost like saying why isn't somebody doing something about this where's the world when these acts of Men against men are happening all over the world. You know, every thirty seconds. You know, you know, where's justice? Where's order? You know, you know, why do we allow this chaos to happen? And of course, the great morality play that is Clockwork Orange is. But when you look at the movie right now, unfortunately, history is caught up to the movie, and uh, the headlines we now live with every day in our lives are not dissimilar to some of the subject matter of this 1960s film uh, Clockwork Orange. Clockwork Orange. Clockwork Orange is a depiction of, 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 of grotesque violence, but it also has utter contempt for violence. That after all of this, you know, you know, deprogramming and uh, and uh, and a kind of proselytizing of the Malcolm McDowell character through science and theory, he comes out the other end more charming, more witty, and with such a devilish wink and blink at the audience that I am completely certain that when he gets out of that hospital he's going to kill his mother and his father and his partners and his friends and he's going to be worse than he was when he went in and so in a sense 
I'd always felt the Clark Work Orange was Stanley's most defeatist movie. The film where he appears to totally give up on society. And the film that maybe justifies why he lives in St. Albans in the safety of the British countryside. Because he was afraid of that. So that was quite interesting about that movie is violent. So that might be one good reason why it was actually banned for, is it? Well, you could say that, yeah, violence and stuff and all that lot. But you can do that on the our, our, our game GTA because obviously back in our heyday we um we we use footage from GTA, don't we, back in 2013. But we know really way back we had to use some die cast um, vehicles, didn't we, and stuff, didn't we? Well, yeah, I know that, but yeah. But we had that episode what was banned, wasn't that, wasn't that? Like? There were quite a few episodes what were banned. Yeah, but they weren't violent, though, were they? Uh, which episode are you actually on about? Yeah, I don't know what he's on about with this Clockwork Orange movie he's on about. Well, if you don't know much about it, I'll put the trailer on then. trailers are all meant to give you a bit of a clue what the films are actually about um, I don't actually understand what that movie's meant to be about well you are well I didn't I mean you, you were the sum it up with you ain't that no I think he's right in one way um, because um, yeah it, it, it's not really telling you really much about it, is it? Well, it is. It's, it, you can gather it's about a naughty young teenager and he uh, it, it, it goes to prison. Oh, I didn't get that with the trailer. Well, yeah, I did, but yeah. And um, what? Well, you get experimented on, right? And... Uh, he, he, he gets out of prison and then then, then his experiment he, 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 well it's, it's more dangerous for him so you know they, they try to you know to reverse it and obviously it gives you that horrible doubt 
on your mind like what's he going to get up to after he's been cured right okay it sounds very bizarre well actually um, a very famous director yeah, more or less put the nail on the head about clockwork orange that it, it's maybe one of them movies what's meant to creep you out alright oh mate we can play a clip so I have a, a revival review of Straw Dogs that was in the LA Reader from uh, February 1983 back when Straw Dogs was playing at the New Beverly and it's from Dave Kerr and Straw Dogs Released the same year as Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange, the Sam Peckinpah film touched off innumerable debates about violence in the movies. But the difference between Kubrick and Peckinpah is a difference between impersonal sadism and an individual morality strongly expressed. Though doubtlessly reactionary, Straw Dogs has the heat of personal commitment and the authority of deep, if bitter, contemplation. It's also movie making of a high order. Dustin Hoffman's performance as the weak mathematician goaded into violence is still his best. I, I mean, I take a little umbrage at uh, him saying Clockwork Orange is about impersonal sadism. I, it's a it's a treatise on on the, you know the value of choice. I actually understand exactly what he means, and I can actually say it was people were very well, uh, no, quick I, to well no more, I think slag on Kubrick for being impersonal and cold. Well, uh, I, I still think he's making a strong case because I mean, if you're talking about the case he's making, I think he's talking about the violent sequences inside of it. And yeah, Beck and Pa is 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 wrestling with the morality that Kubrick is not. Kubrick's trying to creep us out. <laughs> And then he has a larger political allegory attached at the end of it. But that's really kind of highfalutin. And, and well, uh, 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 I'm not saying anything's bad about it. I like Clockwork Orange. No, I know, but. I know, I know. I, I just think it's it's less... Uh, he does make a political allegory. He does talk about the politics of it. But yeah. what he's really talking about is but, what, is, what it, it means suggest- to be able to have choice. But it suggests that it's not personal. It's a high, high-flown high thesis on the subject of, of, of personal choice. One of my negatives about the film, and I would actually in- include this in a lot of Peck and Paws films, where it's uh, um, there's there's some directors that have an alliance with a composer, and their alliance with the composer takes them to new heights, mm-hmm. and takes them to heights that they can never go to on their own. So that director had a lot to talk about Clockwork Orange, but it was quite a, you know a negative about it. I mean, all right, he's saying he he likes the movie, but he didn't sound really reassuring that it's that any good. Well, there could be a problem about that, because obviously, if you look at the images with the um, the vehicle, you know, it's like, you know, just rubbishy buck ejection and all that lot. Right. But, you know, with straw dogs, it's got, like, real cameras on cars and stuff and that. Right. Okay. So? Well, maybe with Clockwork Orange, that it, a lot of people were not that impressed because, yeah, they use special effects. Like, you know, out like the best of them there. We, we've been using, like, green screen and stuff, haven't we? Right, and uh, what is your point? Well, there could be another good point about Straw Dogs, why he's giving it good prizes. It's because it's got Dirty Mary in it. Dirty Mary in it? Yeah, from the one and only Crazy Larry and Dirty Mary. What? Well, Dirty Mary and Crazy Larry, I should say. Right. Uh. Yeah, yeah, that is a good film. Oh, is that the one with the um, charger in it? Yeah, it's that one. But she says, there's somebody knocking on the door and that. Oh yeah, proper petrol head movie in it now, aren't we talking? Now, Pecky Man, right, didn't direct that, but he is well known for doing a diesel head movie. And it's called Convoy. 
Yeah, but we've already done Convoy, haven't we? You know, on another previous Best Automatic. Yes, we all know that we all established doing lorries and we all went through the uh, that greatest uh, movie, you know, at the time with Sam Peckinpah and him and his, you know, his problem and the other people and stuff. But we didn't go proper issues about, you know, his um, Straw Dog movie, what was banned. But why are you on about movies being banned for all of a sudden? Well, yes. I, I am establishing, you know, movies being banned because obviously there's certain episodes of ours got banned because I thought at the time that, you know, when we first started at the humble beginnings we at the, um, you know, in 2013, around that time when um, GTA 5 was out properly, officially on uh, online for us where you know what the, the you know, complications of glitches and stuff and all that though forward too bad but it wasn't was it it, it, you know, it was a bit naff wasn't it but what are you getting at well obviously having violent images does get you banned off maybe tv or youtube and stuff right right so what are you referring at well, there was that episode, and I thought it was something to do with that. You know, like, there's a lot of violent movies, and I mentioned a lot about movies, don't I? Yes, we know, Clockwork Orange, you keep mentioning a lot. Well, yeah, I know, but it is a good, good point why I'm mentioning it, right? Because, obviously, that guy, the director, Quentin Tarantino, is inspired by Straw Dogs, because that got banned, and obviously he's criticised Clockwork Orange, obviously you would, but, you know, because the, the plot may be and that. What are you getting on with now? Well, I'm trying to say that, um, I did that episode, didn't I, about, you know, uh, Quentin Tarantino's friend. His friend now. Yeah, he did a, um, well, it, them two did a two films together, but separate. What are you getting at? We did it on the best automatic about, you know, um, Death Proof. Right. We've already done the um, Death Proof one. That one hasn't been banned. Well, no, I know that, but the thing is, though, it, 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 it's a f familiar, the, you, you, know, you know, the uh, the machete one. The machete one. Is that when you was running around with a machete and killing online players on GTA and shouting out machete? Yeah, I was going machete. Yeah, it was fun. You weren't really, because you got us banned, didn't you? I did. Well, I did, but yeah, that wasn't my fault. That 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 lady, right? That lady. Yeah. The one I got in the argument about Dora Explorer, didn't I? Because um, she was criticising that she didn't know about our, our beloved um, Tomb Raider. And I, I mentioned about Dora Explorer having a bit of a oversized head, like Stewie on Family Guy and that. But the person was three years old. Yeah, well, I didn't know that. I thought it was an 18 rated game. Anyhow, when well, she got a mam on, she was a lady and she was telling me off saying stuff. Yeah, well, you, you did mention your name and that, didn't you? Well, uh, yeah, well, you all know me and Captain Pervert, and obviously you were talking to a three year old on online. Well, I didn't bloody know that, did I? I mean, it's an in rated game, and obviously, you know, the producers thought it was best not to uh, put that on, on, you know, on, on the best automatic. Well, yeah, but that wasn't the point. It was when you was messing about with, um, you know, taco vans and pretending to be machete and that, wasn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, um, like, you know, that very popular car program, in it, you know. What popular car program you're on about? Well, we're on now, don't we? Of course it is. It's obviously, it's going to be Top Gear, right? And they always had famous special guest stars what turned against them. 
What are you on about? Special guest stars turning against them. Right, I'll remember right, that Jeremy Clarkson said one of my mates has to come out and help us, right? Not, not, not James May or Richard Hammond, no. It, it had to be Steve Coogan, right? And Steve Coogan came on onto the show and helped him out with a Ferrari. What do you mean they had these guest stars helping them with Ferraris? Yeah, they did. I mean, don't believe me, man. I put a clip on or what? Well, fair enough then. Okay, well, this leads us on to uh, an idea we've had. It's the Top Gear Down to Earth board. You see, the problem is, is we get a lot of criticisms uh, from viewers who say that we spend far too much time talking about Zondas and Ferraris and Aston Martins and not enough time giving advice, uh, you know, sensible buying advice to, uh, to people in cardigans. So, what we've got here are all the small cars. Uh, there's the little Smart, there's the Mitsubishi Colt on which it's based. Uh, and now we've driven all of these and we think that if you're going to buy such a thing, go for either the Honda Jazz or the Toyota Yaris. Those are the two, okay? Right, now, Aston Martin. Um, when I drove the DB9 earlier this year, I remember thinking, why would anyone buy the Vanquish? I mean, they're the same size, they look pretty much the same, they have the same engine, same power, same top speed, and yet the Vanquish is £60,000 more expensive. It just seemed potty. But now, Aston Martin have said that this has been made a lot, lot better. This is the result, the Vanquish S. to loop across Europe and then one of these if you want a bare knuckle pedal to the metal thrash on a Sunday morning <laughs> so how then have they created this new sportiness it looks the same as the old car from the outside and the interior is pretty similar as well so you're probably expecting the engine to be some kind of nitroglycerine fueled rocket. Let's have a look. Nope. They fiddled with it a bit, but in essence, it's the same 60s of V12 you get in the DB9. I have to say, though, that apart from the gearbox, this is way better than it was before. It feels faster, tauter, and harder. So there's no doubt they have moved it away from the DB9. Unfortunately, however, that means they've moved it right into the firing line of one of the biggest names in the business. What we have here is a Ferrari 575. Like the Aston, it's a big, two-seater, no-compromise sports coupe. With a V12 engine at the front, a flappy paddle gearbox in the middle, and rear-wheel drive at the back. And like the Aston, it has recently been given a thorough going over to make it a bit more of a brute. When the 575 first came out, it was a soft, quiet, rather wallowy old Hector. Now they fixed that quite quickly, and now they've fixed the fix with what they're calling the GTC Handling Pack. For an extra £16,000, you get thicker anti-roll bars, stiffer suspension, fatter tyres, and ceramic brakes. You also get a new exhaust, so it sounds like a Ferrari should. gearbox than the one in the Aston. Still flappy paddles, but less jerky on the way up and faster on the way down. And better still, if you're a serious driver, you can have a proper manual with a clutch paddle. This is really designed for, you know, 
posers, people who've got carpet warehouses in Huddersfield, just want to show off to the mates at Golf Club. Hey, I've got, I've got one of them gearboxes like Michael Schumacher. So, what do we reckon? On paper, these two cars are incredibly similar. They both cost about the same, they both produce more than 500 brake horsepower, and they'll both crack 200 miles an hour. To decide which is best, we need to do some back-to-back -back tests, and that means I need another driver for the other car. There's only one man for the job, Rowan Atkinson. Sadly, Rowan was busy, so I called an old mate of mine. He's a big petrol head, Steve Coogan. The first test we have is a simple drag race. Yes. I've got five more brake horsepower than Coogan in the Ferrari, but I'm carrying an extra 100 kilograms, and it's the weight that's costing me this race. Next, we did a braking test, and once again, the Ferrari was the winner. But the big deciding factor is how these cars make you feel. <laughs> There was no doubt that the Aston made the better noise. But what about everything else? Well, to decide, we pulled over for a little chat. In terms of like drivability, this is just, uh, it just gives you loads of information when you're driving through your fingertips, you can feel the back end going. I mean, this is brilliant. Uh, just that's super brilliant. I wouldn't feel upset if someone gave me that. No. I wouldn't no. feel upset if I, if I bought one. I think no. I've got a really good car. But I, I, I would after about 12 months when I looked at the depreciation. But um, if I didn't have to worry about that, um, uh, my first name was Shake, then I'd probably go for that. I just thought that that was, that was shorter and more muscular, and it is a little bit faster, and it does stop a lot better. The gearbox is better, and I just thought it was the best car. However, however, I'm bored with Ferrari. Well, I just, I don't, styling-wise, I mean, I, I just think there's no contest. That, that's a much more attractive car. Uh, oh, it's a nicer place to sit. Nicer well. place to sit. I always think, really, if you're going to buy a really expensive car, how would you feel sitting in a traffic jam in the car? Mm. I once did own a, a red Ferrari. It was like, it was the Magnum one. <laughs> you know. uh, does, did you have it? Did I have a mistake? I had a stick on one that I just took out of the glove box and, and stuck on when I drove it. <laughs> and uh, I got stuck in a traffic jam in Camden. And I remember people walking past me, hey, there's Steve Coon, his Ferrari. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I was sort of going, hi, yeah, yeah, I've got one of these, yeah. So what we're really saying then is that for a thrashing round on a test track, the Ferrari's the better car. Yeah, definitely, yeah. But we think it's a bit flash and a bit boring now. Yeah, and also they need to, to the stylings, the, the, you know, the last nice, but the 355 is nice, but all those Daytonas and Dinos have real style and there's something just a bit, I don't think these will age well. It, t t given the choice, I'd have one of those. Yeah. So, um, should we, should we arm wrestle for it? We both agreed the Ferrari was the better car, but because of that, we both agreed we'd rather have the underdog, the Minardi, the Tim Henman, the Bolton Wanderer. The Aston Martin Vanquish is not quite good enough to win this test, but precisely because of that, it does win your heart. Do you know what? I would actually save the £60,000 and have the DB9 still. I really would. The problem with this is its gearbox. It's just it's still oh. that bad. Oh no, bad. Robert Mugabe is bad. This is just in a way different league of badness. It's appalling. Now, I mean, the thing is, after I finished with it, gave it to the state, halfway around the lap, it stopped selecting third, went back to the factory, got fixed, came down, he set off again, it stopped selecting all gears, back to the factory again. So did it ever actually manage a complete lap? Yeah, finally, three weeks after it first set off, it finally managed to do a lap. And we've got it for you now. Oh, slow off the line, obviously trying to keep the gearbox in one piece before he gets down to the first corner, which he is approaching now. It's quite tidy through there. Yeah, that's not bad. Right, and into Chicago here. Bit of a lurch going on there, bit of... Oversteer on the way out. Still, the gearbox has worked all the way down to Hammerhead, so that's not bad. Going around that, he's got an awful lot of understeer there. 
because it is quite a heavy car, you have to remember that. Into the follow through, he's going to have to slow down a wee bit for this, that's very, maybe heavy, but it's very fast. Listen to that noise. <laughs> It is one of the greatest noises in the world that that thing makes. Here he is, centre last corner, kissing the apex perfectly, and round the last corner, and across the line. It turns 1 minute 27.1, which goes... Well, that was 136 points. It was down there. Well, that was wet. It was the wettest day we've ever had here, so you can't really do anything like that. i tell you what you might be interested in hearing, though. We timed the DB9 round here. Do you know what time it did? Vanquish S, 127.1. DB9, 127.1. Oh really? It's exactly the same. Pound difference at so exactly the same speed, and it's this gearbox. If they, because it won't, it wouldn't give the steer the gear he wanted. It was driving him nuts. He kept saying, "But you're telling me now, Aston, please stop it. Just stop it. Offer a proper gearbox for proper drivers, you know, because it's such a great car, and they ruin it. They ruin it with that stupid gearbox. Uh, anyway, while they're changing that, let's see how the Ferrari got on. <laughs> Going off the line, he's leaving a huge fat number 11 because of course the gearbox in that can take the power through the first corner. Look how flat that's cornering. It looks just so much more nimble than the Aston. There he is round Chicago. You see that's looking better controlled than the Aston as well. Right, Hammerhead, who it is. You see, none of that understeer that we got from the Aston Martin. He just held the line. Little bit of power oversteer on the way out. Heading down now to the follow through. Okay, he'll have to lift. He has to lift through the tyre wall. Of course, the paddle gearbox is better in this than it is in the Aston, but that is like saying that rabies is better than botulism as he comes round the last corner and across the line. And the time is 126.8. So, it's actually only 0.3 of a second faster than the bank, which only 0.3 of a second faster than the DB9. I was expecting more than that, I must be honest. Nevertheless, Ferrari has won a race. Good Lord. Isn't that amazing? In fact, on that bombshell, we have to end. See you again next week. Good night. So that is a quite good example, as you might have noticed that, you know, he helped out. See, I did tell you. All right, fair enough. And uh, we all know that Jerry McClarkson did all these interviews with all many, many guest stars. Now, you might not believe it, but he did interview um, Steve Coogan as well, who talked about other famous actors he worked with. Right. Oh, if you don't believe me, I'll have a clip on. I didn't say I didn't believe you. It's just there you laugh. Now it's time to put a star in our reasonably priced car. Now my guest tonight once went round the world in 80 days. Well, I hope he's faster than that on our track. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Steve Coogan. Since you were last year, you've become the big Hollywood star. Not really, no. Well, I've, yes, I've tried. Well, you have appeared in a number of Hollywood films. Yeah. Cleese knew this would happen, didn't he? You know, John Cleese, didn't he want some, what did he want Oh, yeah, no, the, uh, yes. Well, I, was, I, was, I did uh, a film with um, uh, John Cleese and Terry Jones, and but it was called Wind in the Willows. And at the time, I had a red Ferrari, um, uh, the Magnum PI style, um, mm -hmm. hence the shirt. Um, and, 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 John, and John Cleese saw me uh, driving up in it, and he said to the uh, to the producer, he went, "Who's driving that Ferrari?" And he went, uh, "Sir Steve Coogan." He went, He's a very, very talented young man, isn't he? And he went, "Yeah, he is." He went, I do hope he gets cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually quite envious of how your life's turned out, to be brutally honest. Because everything you ever do seems to turn to gold. Um, I've had a few misses, but, um, you know... Uh, yeah, there's nice time about... while having the misses, isn't Oh, it? yeah, yeah. I mean, when I, when I did Around the World in 80 Days, there was a scene in the film where I was in a jacuzzi, and I was sat between Jackie Chan and Arnold Schwarzenegger in, in a Chan-Schwarzenegger sandwich. <laughs> 
I didn't know what to, uh, uh, I asked my small talk, I said, are you still driving your Hummer, Arnold? Yes, I have five. <laughs> he said, yes, one is military, ex-military stripped out. I'd like to drive it around LA with my cigar. <laughs> and how does the conversation go to end up in, in a hot tub with you? Get in a hot tub with me, Steve. Yes, <laughs> It'll be something like that. Something like that. <laughs> easily pleased, don't you? Uh, but anyway, listen, Saxondale's your new series. Now, this is a character who is... Uh, he's sort of 50-year-old ex-roadie turned pest controller. <laughs> From Steve. There's a lot of them around. The thing is, okay, I was watching the second episode when your man Saxondale goes to see a motoring journalist <laughs> who's got this TV show about cars. Mm. <laughs> a little clip of that? Let's just, let's have a look at this, okay? Hi, Pest Control, who am I? The very same. Excellente, shimmy on in then, gents. Can I just halt proceedings to doff the proverbial to the governor, read the wheels? R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Yeah, respect. Right, yeah, you, you're an aficionado. Got a Mustang in the drive? Oh, Shelby. I wish, no, Boss 351. Uh, 72. Tweaked. Yeah, flooring the gas on a tweak 351, you'll still put your bowels in your back pocket. Tell me about it. Shall we hunt some rodent then, gents? <laughs> there he goes. So, um... Uh, uh, who's that, then? Uh, well, he's called Jerome Wilson. Um, <laughs> So, so, and uh, someone pointed out to me after that it, 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 it reminded him a bit of you, which is pure coincidence. I'm very flattered and all. Well, I was going to, I was going to ask you to do it, actually. I was going to ask you to be in it as yourself. Yeah. But then I thought, I couldn't quite stick the knife in uh, if it was you. Oh, so, it, yeah, it's done so, it nice and deep there, because it does actually end up with bit of a d isn't it? That's <laughs> how that series ends you can, up. you can only satirise something if you truly love it, though, Jeremy. Well, no, because my wife sat watching it, and when it got to the bit where I'm a bit of a d she was going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I t one of the things I love about it, the way you write stuff, is how much attention to detail you always put into it. And particularly the cars. Because Gareth Cheeseman had the probe, Partridge had the, well, the Rover and then the Lexus, both, you know, spot on for him. And now Saxondale has got the Mustang. I mean, that's just a brilliant piece of casting. Well, it, 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 I was very specific about it. This is where we get really kind of anal about cars, but I, I didn't want a, a, a sort of the GT fastback Mustang from Bullet. No, Stephen Green drive. That's too cool. 390. That's right. See, good. <laughs> so, uh, we, so I wanted uh, the Boss 351. Um, lap. How did it go on today? The new reasonably priced car. Um, I, um, I, I suppose I, someone said to me, well um, actually the stick said to me that, uh, that people who are sport, sportsmen and people who are, if you like, technical people mm -hmm. tend to do better uh, because they listen more and I don't think I'm sort of, I'm more sort of let me just go. So I'm probably not the most disciplined. Uh, well there was certainly some evidence of that on one of your practice lines. Who'd like to see? Right, let's run the tape then. Here we go, just a, a, a little bit of a practice here, and it's bound. Oh, now you see, you've got your tail out, nearly held it. And oh, dear, no! <laughs> Soft suspension. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was quite enjoyable, actually. <laughs> well, shall we see your lap? Yeah, Who'd like to see that? Yeah. Here we go, play the tape. And we're off. Please let me be quicker than Rob Wright. Please. You cut that corner, but that's skinny, so it doesn't matter. That's what it does if you cut the corner. Oh, that's nice and tight through there. I like, I like that. In a second. Cross there. Suddenly, Alan Partridge has taken over the wheel. <laughs> uh, it wasn't really a comic creation, it was you. Yeah, I know. The oh. cat's out the back. Faster. There's a lot of staring at the gear lever going on this. 
Brian Cox is not even annoying me. Staring at it in the hope that it would make them all. That was violent. This now where we had a bit of a ball. Two turn-ins for that corner and the wall. That's nice and brave across the grass. Kept it on there nicely. Gamble on that. Using that to kick the tail out. And there we are across the line. What do you reckon then? I maybe I like to think I'd be above Michael Gamble. Now, can I just be honest with you? The stick said he thinks that the heat might have done something to you. <laughs> or the car, or the track, or something, because he was very flattering about your driving. He did, he said you were very good, competent, late-breaking, aggressive, all of the right things. But, not quick, to be brutal. One minute, 50.9 seconds, so it's... It's there, we'll give him a round of applause. First one ever, hot. <laughs> that's not the lap, that's the temperature. But do you want to know the really bad thing? Perhaps I shouldn't tell you this. Rob Bryden, in the old, less powerful car, quicker. was quicker. <laughs> He's saying that. It's still slower than Rob. Yeah. Would you like to stay the night here? <laughs> Turn your phone up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Coogan! So you can remember all that scandal about, you know, with Steve Coogan and all that lot, when he upset Mr. Arnold and all that lot. What do you mean? Well, when he was making fun out of him and making that Arnold the same stuff and that. What do you mean by that? Well, yeah, I'll play you a clip and then you'll know. Right, okay. He was nice, big, big guy. Yeah. He said, I'm opening the Special Olympics. I went, oh, that's very good. Yeah. It's like the normal Olympics, but for retards. Seriously? Yeah. Did you pick him up on it? Yeah. I said, who are you? Don't be saying using language like that. You? I went, Steve, I'm so no, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, get off me. Leave it out, Coogan. I went, don't talk about people with special needs like that. Right? And he went, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Steve. Leave it out. So, did them two have a big fight or something then after that then? Well, I don't know. Well, we all know that I'm proud of them. We tried to imitate a bit like Top Gear, didn't I? I mean, I mean can you remember me doing the interviews with our special guest stars? Well, technically with me, we having curly hair, it should be me, because I'm the beautiful one, you know, like sexy clacks and aren't I? Well, no, they wanted me to do the interviews, didn't they, at the time? Yeah, yeah, because my mum won't let me come out and play, so you had to do the interview, and then you made a right, you will. Yeah, you made a right mess of it, didn't you? I did it. I was quite good at interviewing. I mean, Mr. Carbold it was very impressed, I think. He didn't say anything to you. Well, yeah. I think I gave the decent, actually, proper interview to our Mr. Arnie because I asked him very appropriate questions about serious ones. Like, we all wanted to bloody know, right? No, especially me, that... Why did he shoot Sharon Stone in the head for in total recall? What? I mean, he came out with that line saying, Consider a divorce now! What was that? Yeah, what was that? I was trying to do an Arnie impression. And you look like, you know, get in the top Oh, 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 put the cocky down! What was that? That's just a noise. Yeah, it is. You're not like, no, like Steve Coogan or anything. Even everybody tries to imitate Arnie, don't they? Yeah, they do, don't they? They go, like, no, no, I'm Arnie. Put the cookie down. Yeah, yeah. If he bleeds, 
you can get it. I'll get in the job. Bah. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, see, see, it's quite easy to do. Now, you're tired of the mate now, right? I oh, probably questions, right? It was insulting and we uh, we got banned before all that, didn't we? What do you mean? Well, well, everything's getting complicated now. We're all doing different voices and all that lot. Well, yeah, we'll do. But, no, you ask Mr. Cabodani about has he um, seen boobies? Well, yeah, that was another thing. Because I want to know, do you shoot Shemmy Stam in the head because you like the lady with the free breasts? Or maybe because Shemmy Stam always got two of them. I mean, you know, you might, you know, if she had three of them, you might not shot her or something. Oh, yeah. So, that's why it was banned, everyone. Wasn't it? Well, no, I know there's worse than like that Steve Coogan did, you know. Because he backstabbed, you know, stabbed knife into, like he wouldn't, well he said he wouldn't do it to Jeremy McClarkson, but he did, didn't he? When he, they had that news flash, didn't they? What, about Top Gear? Yeah, they did, didn't they? Oh yeah, there was, wasn't there, the uh, incident, wasn't there, with the Mexican ambassador? It's the news, so it's important. Listen to the report right now. Now, the presenters of Top Gear have come under fire, again, this time from the comedian Steve Coogan, a frequent guest on their show, for their anti-Mexican jokes on last week's edition of the programme. In a strongly worded article in the Observer newspaper, Coogan says the comments by Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond and James May were misjudged and about as funny as a cold sweat followed by shooting pains down the left arm. Coogan was responding after the Mexican ambassador to the UK made a complaint to the BBC. It's James Blake. Why Sorry. would you want a Mexican car? It started as a chat about a sports car, but it prompted the Mexican ambassador to complain of outrageous, vulgar and inexcusable insults. Mexican car's just going to be a lazy, feckless, flatulent <laughs> over <laughs> Leaning against the fence asleep, looking at a cactus with a blanket with a hole in the middle on as a coat. I wouldn't feel upset if someone gave But now a former guest on the show, the comedian Steve Coogan, who often attracts controversy himself, has launched an attack on the Top Gear presenters. Writing in The Observer, he says, with Top Gear it is three rich middle-aged men laughing at poor Mexicans, and said their comedy was lazy, feckless and flatulent. <laughs> They can't do food, the Mexicans, can they? Because it's all, like, sick with cheese on it. And today, other comedians have waded into the mire. We should look at whether they've done good comedy or bad comedy. Whether it's dangerous comedy, as in dangerous that it supports prejudice, or whether it's dangerous comedy, as in challenges prejudice. Um, and the best comedy is comedy that makes us question. If you look at Partridge or David Brent, um, what they're doing is similar jokes. You can imagine David Brent doing the Mexican jokes, but at the same time there's a framework where they're saying, are, are you right to laugh at this? And with the Top Gear people, there seems to be no framework. There seems to be just a casual, blokey, let's laugh at it. Uh, and I think that's what's lazy about it. Did anyone see Top Gear the other day? There was a rant about Mexicans that Richard Hammond made. Tiffany um, Stevenson is a leading light in London's stand-up circuit. Today she was testing material for a new routine. The three of those, when you look at them, you go, you've pretty much only seen culture inside of a yoghurt pot. Just imagine waking up and remembering you're Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be brilliant. That'd be brilliant because you, you could just go straight back to sleep again. The worst part of it was when he said, imagine waking up in the morning and being Mexican. I thought, wow, you know, if you replace that with various other words like Palis Palestinian or Israeli, you know, people would be losing their minds. And I think we've taken a bit of an attitude that because it's Mexicans, it's far enough away or not in the news or not topical, that actually it doesn't really matter. So this growing backlash against the Top Gear presenters hasn't come from the area you might expect, not the Equalities Commission, but other comedians. The Quality and Human Rights Commission said it won't take a stand because it won't police school on humour. You're not bothered about what he said particularly. I am bothered about what he said because I think it's juvenile, it's vulgar, it's, you know, it's unacceptable. But that's for broadcasters and columnists to argue about. It's not for the law. We need to deal with more serious things. 
Jeremy Clarkson has made an apology of sorts in his column in The Sun, but then accused the Mexicans of being humorless. On his website, Richard Hammond writes, If we really have upset anyone, if they really feel I was expressing a genuinely held view that I believe Mexico to be populated by blokes in big hats and moustaches, then I am very sorry. The BBC has also apologised to the Mexican ambassador, saying the comments were mischievous, but with no vindictiveness behind them. FBI, open up! That a bloody funny matter if they're sending Dory Explorer, you know, what killed bloody Tomb Raider off, you know, Laura Croft, ah, it's serious, ah, moving on, next thing, bloody weather, isn't it, nah. Well, I suppose maybe Steve Coogan did have a political good point, especially about, you know, the, it's the comedy, and obviously, you know, it's about against the firm, you know, people from a different country, isn't it? I mean, it could have got really worse, couldn't it? What you mind by that? Like that other race of people or species of people I should say what what you might what you were comparing with what you mean yeah, yeah I'm a bit confused well he was classing Mexican people uh, like Yorkshire people well, they aren't they they're behind a partial wall, aren't they? Between Lancashire and all that lot. Yeah, but you can't just compare Yorkshire people like, you know, Mexicans, can you? Well, no, but I did, because it is like that. It isn't. I think we, 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 we're getting too debatable. Well, actually, I think we should end the show because we haven't got anything going yet, have we? What you mean? All we've been talking about up to a nearly hour and we haven't done nothing with the news. What's the fastest car around our test track? Or some mad event we're doing. All we've been mo talking about is, well, morning I would say, that about you upsetting and having episodes being banned. What are you always blaming me for? I think on that note. What do you mean on that now? Uh, on that um, broken piano, we should um, end the show.